Welcome to Join the Conversation, a podcast of the Student Housing Matters blog. Join the Conversation features interviews with higher education leaders about their institutions and careers in higher education and their perspectives on the role on-campus student housing plays on a university campus. Joining the Conversation today is Franz Johansson. An author, entrepreneur, and consultant, Franz has spoken to audiences around the world about achieving success. His debut book, The Medici Effect, shattered assumptions about how great ideas happen and was named one of the best books on innovation by Business Week and one of the top 10 best books of the year by Amazon.com. He recently spoke at Nakubo this past July about his follow-up book, The Click Moment, where he obliterates the idea that in business you can strategize, plan, and analyze your way to success. Franz, I had the opportunity to hear you speak during one of the general sessions of the National Association of College and University Business Officers, or NACUBO, at their annual conference uh, this past July. And during that session, you focused on your latest book, The Click Moment, which you're going to tell our listeners about today. But before you discuss your book, tell us a little bit about your educational and career background, including what person or persons had the greatest impact on your life. Well, I... I uh, I grew up in Sweden, so through you know up until through high school, I uh, I was in Sweden. Um, I had a very strong interest in a number of different areas, uh, something that I has held held true my entire life. But then after that, I went to I applied to I uh, went to college at the Brown University in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and there I studied environmental science. Um, Primarily because I have a very strong interest in fishing, and so throughout my life I've been sort of involved in efforts to sort of address overfishing and things like that. So environmental science seemed to be a very uh, make a lot of sense to me. At that point, I was convinced that I was going to go ahead and uh, get a PhD in marine biology, uh, but I wanted to do something before I I went into grad program. So I uh, I started a company actually out of uh, undergrad, a, a medical device company. And uh, a few years of that, and I realized that I think my interest slide was sort of more towards business. And I went to Harvard Business School for uh, after that. And that was, that was also not entirely straightforward because I left it because I started a software company. It took off when I was in class. I had 30 employees while I was taking a class that that obviously wasn't working. So I left. I ran that company for a while. This was during the dot-com era, though. So when I shut it down... Uh, which inevitably happened as everything crashed around us. Um, I went back and completed my uh, my degree, and that was finally when I got the idea to write my first book. So that was sort of my journey. <laughs> well, you know, you're obviously a very highly creative and energetic person. Is there a person in your family or oh. that really you you're, you got that from or or learned that from? Right. So you so you asked the question of who who uh, uh, who inspired me. So. Uh, Without a doubt, the two most inspirational people in my life uh, are my parents. Um, uh, my uh, my mother, uh, well, she was a teacher. She's she's retired now, but um, so education to her was very important. She grew up in Hickory, North Carolina, uh, and uh, you know, as a as a as a black woman to move from she she moved to Germany to teach there, and then she married my dad, who is Swedish. And grew up in Sweden. It was just, it's very inspirational to see, you know, there's was, was a lot of shifts, let's just say that. Sweden wasn't exactly like uh, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad, um, he started a sports fishing magazine and he taught me something else that I carried with me. So, so my mom brought the educational piece to it. My dad taught me that, um, that you should do the things that you're passionate about. My dad was passionate about two things, writing and fishing. He started a sport fishing magazine, uh, which became the largest one in Scandinavia, actually. So I'm like, that seems like, it seems like a simple equation. It's tough, of course, to follow. Everybody knows that. But uh, that simplicity of staying true to the things that matter to you, that you're passionate about, that you, that you have a burning desire for, uh, very inspirational. Um, anybody outside of family would probably be Tolkien because I love Lord of the Rings and, and the way he created that world. So that creative aspect is carried with me as well. <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting. Well, the click moment starts out by explaining the paradox of a common belief system, 
We all know life is uncertain and random, yet at the same time, we believe we can analyze and plan for success. Yeah. Franz, why do we so strongly believe the latter, and what stories have reinforced this belief in our lives? Well, I, you know, there's, well, there's a lot of research to clearly establish the fact that we want and seek explanations for almost all kinds of events that occur around us. Um, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of theories as to why that is. Uh, mostly sort of comes down to evolutionary fitness. You know, it's, um, you know, it, it, when, when the world makes sense around us, we, we, we propel, we move forward. And I believe, I believe that there's truth to that. I believe that that if we if if we if we think there's a reason behind an action, if we think there's a rationale, we 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 are we sort of we drive ourselves forward towards it. It turns out, though, of course, that once you examine it more closely, uh, doesn't the world doesn't really work that way? Um, almost every single person I interviewed in the research of the right in the click moment, I mean, to a person, everyone, when I asked them to describe their career. When I asked them to describe what had happened in their life, who they ended up married, turns out this click was all over the place. They had a thought, they had perhaps even a plan, but oh, it was you know, a meeting somewhere, an unexpected lecture that made somebody think in a different direction. A, you know, and in, for the people that are you know, listening to this, uh, you, you, you can see some of this happening. This tends to increase in frequency when people are close together, when people are living in, 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 in close quarters, specifically, you know, definitely in a the, in the university setting, um, uh, where, where, where you may have thought that you're going down a particular path, uh, but uh, something happens that takes you off of it. This, had, this turns out to be true in our individual lives. This turns out to be true in, for companies. Uh, so one of my favorite stories is in the book is the one on Starbucks, where um, you know the founder, the CEO of Starbucks, Howard Schultz, he got the idea of Starbucks of serving coffee in a cup at Starbucks when he accidentally walked into an espresso bar in Milan. Before that, coffee was selling coffee, uh, Starbucks was selling coffee makers, but he saw people drinking coffee and he said, "Oh my God, this is this is what it's all about." And uh, and, of course, everything after that is history. Starbucks today is one of the most successful companies in the world. Well, you know, uh, one of the things I really enjoyed when I attended your uh, session at the Kubo was the hands-on, pardon the pun, way that you explained the random nature when you got us to turn to the person on our left or right and play rock, paper, scissors. Yes. Uh, I, I have to admit, I was, I was wondering where that was going when you did that, but... Tell us a little bit about okay. why you had us do that and how that supports your theory. So, so here's the so here's the thing. Um, uh, and anybody who's viewing this, uh, kind of go ahead and do this. Um, uh, when you get a chance, play a game of rock paper scissor with someone. The rules are fairly straightforward. Everybody, I think, has uh, will recognize them from uh, from childhood. And uh, it's a game that, uh, by its very definition. It seems to have no winning strategy. I mean, it, you know, because any any move you make can always be counteracted by another move uh, that your opponent is making, um, and uh, it's called an intransitive relation. Now, here's the thing: <laughs> when you play this game, somebody is going to end up winning, and actually, there's a world annual championship in rock paper scissors. There's even a strategy guy. For rock, paper, scissor. And the reason that is curious is because you can mathematically prove, you can mathematically prove that the only dominant strategy in rock, paper, scissor is to stay utterly random. Utterly mm -hmm. random. If you're staying utterly random, you have the best chance of winning over the long run. This is, this is a case of just running the numbers and working through, um, uh, you know, various gaming um, strategies. But no winner has ever used a random strategy. It's always used something else. And the reason for why that is, is because saying to somebody, be random, is not practical. What are you supposed to do with information? Yes, life twists and turns on a dime. It does. But we still have to act as kind of if we know what we're doing. And so the point of the rock, paper, scissors game is to say, look, 
whoever is winning or losing in this, that is actually a matter of chance. But, but if you're trying to enter it with some sort of strategy in mind, do so because the purpose of strategy is not to come up with the right answer. It is to enable you to act. It is to enable you to move. It is to give you the, the inspiration to get something done. To overcome the inertia. To overcome the inertia. inertia. Yeah. Overcome the inertia, get something done. And yeah, you're probably wrong. It's okay. World is un uncertain. So you just for it. But you have to act, you have to do. And just to. Uh, one, a story that I love about this is uh, 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 Stephanie Meyer, who wrote uh, Twilight. You know, she had a dream. She woke up one morning and she wrote a book over three months. She didn't want to show it to anybody. She shows it to her sister, though, and her sister convinces her to sort of seek it to get it published. Uh, you know, it, it does get published. People are panning it left and right because the writing is so atrocious, uh, which it kind of freely admits to that she's not the best writer in the world. So what? She sold over 120 million copies. That's how life works. It's better to do something, to do anything than trying to always get it right from start. Well, you've talked a little bit about my next question, but I, I guess if you stop with the random nature of success, it really would be discouraging because you oh. really wouldn't know what to do. But you, you do tell a lot in your book about individuals and organizations and how they experience that click moment and, and how they turn that to a, their favor. Can you talk a little bit about what the click moment is, how that works? Right. So the click moment really refers to a particular point in time where something's happened that is not necessarily predictable. So, for instance, if you go to the library and you say you're trying to solve a particular challenge, let's say in geology, you're looking for a particular mineral, and you find a book, and you go to the, and you go to the book that has minerals, and you find a solution in there, that's not random. That is not a click moment. That is just something that is entirely predictable. But if you're on your way, and while you're looking for that book, you happen to stumble across another book that gives you a completely different idea, well, that is what I call a click moment, if that idea is meaningful to you. That idea might even set you off in a different direction for an entirely new thesis. Okay, so... That's the click moment. So you talk a lot in the book about how we can create those kind of click moments, you know, certain strategies that we can all follow. And I know one of them was, you know, go to conferences that you never go to before, read magazines you've never read. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the strategies that we can all implement to, to create more of those click moments. I'll talk about uh, two. So the one you refer to refers to what I call intersectional thinking. And it really says that, uh, when you're trying to think of new ideas, when you're trying to think of new solutions, or opportunities, uh, we have two approaches that we kind of take. One is to do what's logical. So like, well, who are the experts in this industry or who are the experts in this particular, who has done this before? And so we go and we, and we talk to them. The thing is that everybody else is talking to the same people. So you're going to end up coming up with ideas that have been thought of before that are similar to what other people are thinking of. Uh, what I'm saying is actually connect with others that are different. It might not make immediate sense uh, why these connections are there, but, but when you do make a connection, things will click into place. So, uh, I mean, some of these, and my entire first book was centered around this. You know, one of my favorite examples of this is uh, an architect that designs. Uh, a building that uses 90% less energy than any other building around it. This is in Zimbabwe uh, because he doesn't need to use an air conditioner. How do you think of this idea? He looked at termite ecology and how termites build their mounds on the African savanna. Most architects wouldn't look there for a solution. They would talk to other architects and maybe engineers and say, okay, how can we design this? But if you look outside of your area, your discipline, your field, your culture, you're going to come up with something that clicks. And those are the things that set you apart. And the second piece is, in order to avoid this sort of trap of logic, of always do the thing that makes sense, sometimes just reverse what it is that you're doing. Uh, I tell the story of Marcus Samuelson, who got selected to do the state dinner when the Indian Prime Minister came to uh, the U.S. a couple of years ago. And 
he received only a couple of serious limitations. One was every single state dinner in the history of the United States had had French American cuisine. So just that's just one of them, one of the sort of the, the constraints. He was like, well, I'm competing with about what 16 others, 15 other chefs, all top chefs. So I'm not going to do a French American cuisine. <laughs> I'm going to reverse the assumption. I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to do the unlogical thing or illogical thing. And uh, he came up with something else. They chose him. Why? Because it is an idea that stands out. It is a way to make something click into place. Because once he went down that road, he came up with a bunch of other stuff. He's like, well, you know what? We can get our, get our vegetables from the garden that's, uh, that's next to the White House and so on. So there is, there is a way of unlocking click moments, but you do so by doing something that is sort of almost a re – it's like a mind experiment, but you reverse your assumptions. You reverse – the, the immediate solutions. You say, what if I did the opposite of that? What would happen? And occasionally you'll have a moment that just clicks into place. That's, That's great. great. And let's let's, let's, let's uh, do a little exercise here. I want you to imagine that you're the director or the manager of a on-campus housing community. You've got a uh, thousand students that you're uh, responsible for. And every year you go to the same conferences, you go to the COI, the Association of College and University Housing Officers, which is a wonderful organization. Uh, you go to, like you were saying, the, the typical things you engage with your colleagues. If you, Franz, were in that position, what would you do to, to create these click moments? What, what kind of other conferences or other books or other experiences would you, would you do? I think it's a phenomenal question. And uh, so the first thing I would do is actually, and I mean, I do this in our office um, all the time. I would look at, okay, what, is all, what, what are all the things that I'm reading uh, and where I'm getting my insight from right now? And I'd line it up. Now, I'm not going to ignore it completely, but I'm going to occasionally take a step outside of it. I'm going to say, okay, for now, I want to, for this meeting, or for this day, I am going to look at other areas for insight. So you can start right. This is something that somebody who's looking at this can do right now, like today, and say, well, what happens if I try to gain inspiration from a interior design magazine? What happens if I'm looking at a skiing magazine? What happens if I look at a website that, uh, that does design, or whatever it is. But it is something that is different from where you're usually getting your information. That's the first piece. That's very quick. The second one is, on a slightly longer term, where would you go to gain new insight around, for instance, you mentioned conferences. I think it's great. One of the people that I talked to in the book, she's a chief diversity officer at Nike. And she rarely goes to diversity conferences. She goes to a couple to make sure that she's in tune with the baseline. And I think that's important. I really do. But then the rest is completely different areas, and she's using it to draw ideas. So anybody who's viewing this, I would start with conferences that you have an interest in. Almost everybody has an interest somewhere else. And as long as, and this is the key point, here's where, here's where it, that ties it together. If you do that, you have to actively try to make a connection between the ideas that you see at this conference and tie it back to student housing, right? So okay. how, is the, how is the military thinking about housing? Can you make a connection? How are they thinking about housing in... Um, in uh, Bedouin tribes, can you make a connection? Uh, obviously, these are two vastly different types of areas, but they're likely to make you come up with ideas that you haven't thought of before. And you don't have to just think of housing. You can think of the way, so you ha you're dealing with thousands of people, students in a particular setting. What, how do, how do um, stadium, people that deal with stadium, stadiums and, and, and other large scale type of, where you deal with a lot of, a lot of people, how do they think about it? How do hotels think about this? 
that is a fairly close one, but mm -hmm. expand the vision as to people that are working on issues that you're running into and seek out solutions there. The likelihood of you having a click moment, the likelihood of you coming up with something different escalates it exponentially. Wow. Well, this is just a lot of fun. And I tell you, I could probably talk to you for about another 20 or 30 <laughs> minutes. I, I would love to have you in a brainstorming session in my office sometimes. So, <laughs> if you're ever down in Birmingham, Alabama, you have a you have a, an open invitation. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Thank you. I, I want to hold up the book. Uh, this is the click moment. And if you haven't read it, consider yourself Ill illiterate, ignorant, uh, uneducated. Uh, I even have my uh, signature from uh, Franz that uh, he signed it uh, right after oh. uh, the Kubo. So, uh, so anyway, uh, get the book. Uh, it's, it's a great book. I, I've got lots of underlines in here and uh, I'm going to be passing this around the office. And Franz, all the best to you for the success of this book. Thank you very and, much. Uh, to, to our viewers, uh, we're going to have a link on our website so that you can order this. Uh, and uh, again, thank you so much, Franz, for joining us and all the best to you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for listening.